One more. <laughs> Smile. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. Is that good? Yeah. I'm Alison Fryer. As you all know, I'm from the cookbook store. And we're delighted to kick off our fall chef season with Magnus uh, Nielsen from Norden, Sweden. He was born in 1983. And for those of you, come on, who remember? What's that significant? That's the year the cookbook store started. Thank you. Magnus is going to do a little presentation with slides for about 20 minutes. Then we'll have another conversation and do Q&A from the audience. And we'll also do the book signing afterwards outside in the lobby, where, yes, you can also get your one or two pictures taken with Max as well. Yeah. All right, take it away. And I love the title, a Strange Restaurant. Yeah, but a lot of people say that it's a explain. strange restaurant, so that's why I sort of titled the, uh, this particular talk that way. Um, and I'm going to start just for a few minutes to introduce the restaurant and what we do a little bit for those who might not be familiar with what we are working with up there. And then I'm going to spend a little bit longer talking about vegetables, how we grow them and how we store them. Um, this, is, this, this talk is a rerun. So there's actually two people here who's already seen it. I have to apologize for that. It's not very often it happens, but it's a nice talk. Um, for those of you who doesn't know where Sweden is, yeah. um, so this is maybe more relevant. That's where Fabiken is. So I usually say that it's sort of in the northern part of Sweden, which is actually wrong because it's more or less in the middle of Sweden, but people kind of don't get how tall a country Sweden is. Um, this is sort of how I see my restaurant. Fabiken is a very small restaurant. It's only, how we said, between 12 and 16 covers, depending a little bit on the size of the tables. Uh, for it to be 16, it has to be a table of six, a table of four, and three tables of two. So we quite often fill up on less than that. Um, I think one of the most important things for any chef anywhere in the world is to make the most out of whatever possibilities and difficulties you are presented with in your surrounding. And that's really the thing we're trying to do up there, to do something really great with whatever we have available. This is a question I get quite often. Why do you work only with produce from a certain area, our area. Um, and it's actually, um, it's, it's very simple. It's just because of quality. And it's not, like the produce doesn't get better because it's sourced from a particular area, but it gets a lot better when you can talk to people, we can, when you can have an ongoing relationship with your producers. Should I stay further in the back? Is that why it's making funny sounds? <laughs> Yeah, I should just keep on going and say, okay, well, that's great. Um, no, so like, that's the reason why I work with local produce. It's not because it's local. It's not really because of the environmental thing either. It's just because it's so good to have an ongoing dialogue with, with the producers of what you cook. And then that is good for the environment, that it hasn't been transported, and all those things, yeah, they're really great. But for me, there are sort of positive side effects <coughs> to what we do. Why do you have so few seats? Next question I get very, very often. I guess uh, you would think they maybe uh, with a restaurant that kind of grown uh, particularly or quite well known um, uh, all over the world as Fabrican has done over the last few years, we could fill a bigger restaurant, which we actually could. But then we would have to change everything because Fabrican is not only um, a small restaurant; it's also a restaurant that works in a particular way because it's kind of a communal eating experience. Everyone arrives at the same time, which is seven o'clock. And then we do our little matchmaking thing, and we just put all the companies together um, in, the, in the sofas downstairs, and they will have the drinks and appetizers. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, after that, at 7.30, you will go up and have your separate tables in the dining room and have a sort of an ordinary restaurant experience, and then go down again for coffee at 9.30. And I really want to keep that because we can uh, work with produce in a very particular way. We can be very, very careful when sourcing them because we don't need that much. We do about 60 covers a week normally. And also, I like to talk in front of everyone because that gives you extra time to really uh, go into the stores and give people the context and the background about what they're eating. And we couldn't do that with a larger restaurant. So this is sort of the the basics of the restaurant. There are 11 people in total working there. Seven of them in the kitchen, and then three in the dining room, plus me. Uh, one chef, the head chef, he's responsible for all, all the products that come into the kitchen, and that sort of makes up more or less all of his job, is that he sees too that we have a constant flow of produce coming into the restaurant, which was one of the big sort of challenges in the beginning to um, because we often, like, when we run out of onions, we just can't really call someone and buy new onions because there aren't any. So 
Yeah, and it's his job to see to you that we have a perfect flow so that we never, ever, ever have to go down in quality all through the year. It can always be consistent. Uh, but 50% of all hours worked at Fabric and in the kitchen are related to sourcing produce, which is quite a lot. Most restaurants, they spend maybe 2% of their time doing that, just picking up a phone uh, and, and calling in produce from a supplier. So, that was a little bit about restaurants. Now I'm going to talk about how we do with vegetables. So this is sort of a little diagram which I made um, to, to sort of explain the vegetable year at Fabric. And, and, and if you look, like a lot of people see all the Nordic restaurants as something that's largely sustained itself on foraged um, herbs and stuff, which is actually, it's a large part of what we do, but it's also in relation to other things uh, quite insignificant. Um, you can see, if you look at the bottom line, uh, where it's marked May and June, that little blue stripe, that's when we work with the foraged herbs and vegetables. The only time of the year is about six weeks, and that's it. Uh, it continues with more foraging from August to uh, end of October, and that represents berries and mushrooms that are foraged. And then you have the red line, so that's sort of the difficult part when we have, uh, or that's the nice part when we have uh, like everything fresh from the vegetable garden. And there is for like one brief moment in the end of September or something, you have like one week or ten days maybe when we have everything. We have fresh vegetables, we have storage vegetables, and we have all the foraged mushrooms and berries, and that's really a wonderful time of the year. Uh, but as you see, most of the year there is a green line, green line, and that represents produce or vegetables that have been stored or prepared in some way to keep for a long time. And that's uh, something that's been very important to us, and something that's also been important to give the restaurant a particular <coughs> character. This is a shot that's taken just outside the restaurant, about one kilometer from the from the doors of the restaurant, and this pretty much represents the kind of terrain that we work in, and this pretty much represents the kind of areas that I would forage in. Uh, this is a little list of things that we work with, and I'm quite certain that a lot of what you see here is probably also available here. Because, and also one of the reasons why I wanted to do this talk here in Canada is that I kind of think that a lot of things are probably quite similar when it comes to climate and flora from Sweden, from the north across Sweden to here. And if everyone has a, or if anyone has a particular interest in this, they can just email me and I send the list, you know, because it's very long, so I'm not going to go through that. So, the vegetable garden. <coughs> this is something that I'm very proud of. Um, it started for, <coughs> yeah, same, same year as the restaurant started, 2008, with me just digging up a little vegetable patch, um, uh, maybe 20 square meters or something, and farming a few vegetables for us. And I quickly realized that like, growing your own vegetables is really, really interesting in many ways, uh, because you can control the whole process. You can choose the variety that you think will suit your needs, and then you can farm it exactly the way you want, and you can harvest it when you can put it at its peak, which is really great. And also in the summer, uh, you can work with things that are really fresh. You can basically send the chef down, you can pick the pea, like the pea pods, and then run up to the kitchen during service and more or less pop them on the plate, which you couldn't do if you didn't have your own garden. Um, so these are one image from early spring, when everything is just coming green and lush, and this is one image after the first snow, and it's the same spot as you see. <coughs> This is the gardens during the summer when it's a little bit nicer and when they're sort of in full bloom. And this is during that really nice time when we have everything ready. So this is how the gardens are sort of uh, uh, laid out. And we use, like for me, gardening is a learning process. And it's, as you see, it kind of grown a little bit bigger than 20 square meters. So it's 0 0.6 hectares now, uh, so 6,000 square meters. Uh, and we experiment with a few different techniques. One of them uh, is obviously crop rotation, which is something that everyone at Gross Vegetable probably knows about. And we're experimenting with different uh, uh, types of crop rotation to see what gives us the perfect yield and, and still maintains the quality of the soil without depleting it. Um, if we start sort of on the left there, uh, we have a four-part crop rotation, which means that there are four parts and they each sort of move place every year, um, which means that it's going to be four years between, like for example, if you uh, uh, grow brassicas, like cabbage and stuff, they use a lot of nitrogen from the soil. Uh, the year after that, you're going to grow something that refills the stocks with nitrogen. Going, for example, grow leguminous plants, peas and beans and stuff. Uh, and, and that's sort of how it goes on. 
And we do this not only to keep the soil healthy, but also to prevent the build-up of microbes that could affect all these different crops. Uh, yeah, this is an image from the four-part crop rotation, which is quite a sort of straightforward uh, farming that you would see, or a vegetable growing that you would see in any sort of home vegetable patch, I guess, you know. We have this white sort of fiber cloth to, uh, to uh, mainly in the spring to keep um, the seedlings away from the frost. So if you have a late frost, they won't kill off all the seedlings. Uh, in the middle, we have a six-part crop rotation, which is a more intense way of farming the land. <coughs> uh, um, and this one has 30% of it always covered with leguminous plants that are not harvested, but just sort of turned down into the soil every year. Uh, every autumn to give back nitrogen. You know, uh, leguminous plants, they have a little uh, bacteria on the roots that, um, that they bind uh, nitrogen from, from the atmosphere. So you can sort of, by rocking them in the garden, you can more or less fertilize it without adding any fertilizer. It's quite cool. Um, and that part is also covered like this, you see. So there's a matted black cloth with little holes for all the crops. And this is something that enables us to grow things up there that you normally shouldn't be able to grow there. Um, because it, it uh, elevates the, uh, or it heightens the soil temperature quite a lot. So this makes our growing climate almost the equivalent of the one in the southern part of Sweden, 600 kilometers to the south. So we can more or less grow everything but solaria, if that just doesn't work for some reason. Um, down to the right, we have a three-part crop rotation, which is, um, which is actually my personal favorite, because I find that the six-part one, the most effective one, it kind of takes away a little bit too much of the nutrients from the soil. And since we don't use any machinery, we just, so it's all turned by hand with pitchfork, it's quite difficult to, uh, uh, to, to put that back in the soil again by adding manure and by adding green manure to the leguminous plants. Uh, so this one is actually my favorite, and it sort of works in the same way, it's less intense, um, and instead of the matted cloth, the textile cloth, we use cyst clippings of grass to cover the soil, to keep the humidity in and to elevate the soil temperature a little bit. Uh, the herb gardens. This is actually the red house, it's the restaurant. In the back, the one with the, sort of the, the higher ceiling, that's the dining room, and the hotel would be in the part that's closest to the herb garden. And this is where we grow all the um, all the things that we would use as green vegetables during summer, and all the herbs, and also all the herbs that we would dry later on in the year to keep for the winter, for use in the winter. So, when it comes to storing, when you store vegetables, you have to make this decision. Either you kill them, or you use, um, uh, or you don't do that. And if you kill them, it's basically, the idea is that you kill the vegetable and you keep everything else in the sort of restricted area around the vegetable. It can be, for example, uh, a kilner yard, a glass yard. And you can, for example, take a carrot, you can put it in with some brine, and then you can pasteurize the whole thing, you can cook it in an oven. And then you kill the vegetable, but you also kill everything else around. And that will make it keep for a long time. You can uh, pickle it, you can um, uh, add vinegar to the, to, the, to the jar, you can uh, add a lot of salt, and you can do different things that sort of uh, make it keep. Um, and this is probably when people are thinking of preserving vegetables, this is most often what sort of pops into people's mind, and it's the killing techniques. Um, and there are also non-killing techniques, and I think what's important to, um, to realize is that none of them are better. They're just very different. They produce different results. But what I think is interesting with those techniques that don't kill the vegetables is that you have different mechanisms within any vegetable that can make them keep for a long time. For example, all the root vegetables that we harvest, there are biennials. So they grow from a little seed the first year, uh, and during the summer, through photosynthesis, they collect a lot of energy, which is storing in terms of um, carbohydrates in the root, which is what we consume. And the idea is that in the end of the first summer, they go dormant, and they lie in the ground, under the snow, all through winter, and then in spring, <clears throat> because they have all this energy stored up. They don't have to wait until they have enough sunlight. They can just grow, 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 grow really quickly before anyone else can grow. And they can put their seeds earlier so they get sort of ahead in, in the race, in the race for, for um, uh, world domination probably by bee fruits. Um, <clears throat> and this is what we use. We just fool the vegetables. We pick it up at autumn when it's sort of going dormant, when it's ripe, uh, when it's mature. And instead of leaving it in the ground, we just 
uh, put it in, 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 for example, sand in our cellar, in our root cellar, and then instead of letting the vegetable go to bloom the next year, we eat it during the winter instead. This is interesting, I think. Uh, all of these methods to, to prolong the shelf life or to keep make uh, vegetables keep for a longer period of time, it's, it's nothing that makes them better ever, ever, ever. It just makes them different. Like, if you pull a carrot, carrot up from the soil and eat it straight away, it will be the most carrot it will never, ever, ever, ever or it will be the most carrot it will ever be. Like, everything you do to that carrot after picking it up from the ground, it's going to make it less of a carrot. And it's not going to, um, it's not going to make it um, more of a carrot, it's just going to make it more different, and that's also good though, because that might be something you want, and that's something that we've seen, because we started storing vegetables out of necessity, because we wanted to, because we wanted to serve vegetables of great quality all through the year, um, and then we realized that doing this, it gives a lot of character, you know, it gives a certain flavor to our food that we wouldn't get if we didn't do these things, which, is, which I find interesting at least. Yeah, that's <laughs> so many of the green vegetables can be kept in the in the gardens, and they, they don't mind if it's a bit cold. And this is yeah, in December, so it's about minus twenty five, and and you can still harvest them, and they don't it doesn't ha it doesn't really matter if they freeze. Uh, and it's really 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 interesting, and I don't know why actually. And I've spoken to a lot of people that should know why, but it's like if you harvest that broccoli in September and you freeze it in your freezer inside and then you defrost it, it's a frozen broccoli, and it's so floppy and boring. If you leave it on the plant and you let it freeze, and then you harvest it, you have to break it off in December and you take that in, it's a fresh broccoli. And it's very interesting, actually. And we, we often do this with, uh, with the different brassicas, like broccoli, kale, Brussels sprouts, and so on. We just leave them, and they can stand there until we use them all, or until the moose have gotten in and eaten them all, if they really like them. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a method of using uh, what I talked about earlier with the sort of that non-tillage killing technique for root vegetables that that um, uh, uses the natural function in them to lie dormant during the winter. And you just collect all the root vegetables, um, you dig two little ditches or trenches for drainage, and with a little sort of raised mound of soil in the middle, you put a little bit of straw to uh, drain off any uh, any water that comes in there. <coughs> You put all the root vegetables on top of the straw, and then you dress it with even more straw to insulate over them, and then you sort of cover the whole thing in soil. And you make like a nice pyramid or sort of a nice sloping shape like this so that any water can run off on the sides and don't sort of go into the, the actual clam. And this is one of the oldest techniques of keeping root vegetables, and it's, it works really well. It's quite unpractical though, because you know you have to dig down there so there's no um, and also when you have broken the clamp, when you picked out your first root vegetables, you kind of have to take out everything out. You can't just take one and then close it up again because it will be cold in there and, and, and so on. 